Hello. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start and uh, welcome you all to this event, which is called The Future of Teaching and Learning at UMW. It's, as I am often want to do, an enormous topic that we couldn't possibly talk about in two hours, um, but we're going to try. We're going to see what we can pull out of our... Um, pull out of our pockets and our um, brains and put onto the table. My goal with this event is for it to be kicked off by a keynote from Kevin Gannon, but also for then it to turn into a conversation, which will in some ways respond directly to some of the prompts and some of the challenges that we'll hear in Kevin's talk, um, but also that we don't necessarily know where that conversation will go until we're having it. And that's kind of the exciting thing about this process. I want to read you just a little bit um, th that I prepared and then riff on a quote from Kathy Davidson. Um, UMW is currently working to reimagine its university teaching center. My hope with this event is to spur some of our thinking, not about the specifics of that center as much as to stir the kinds of conversations that underlie all of our thinking about the constantly changing nature of teaching and learning at UMW and beyond. I find myself at a moment like this, right after the election, thinking about what the future of education is. I'm a, I have a two-year-old daughter. I find myself thinking about the world she's going to grow up in and imagining the college that she's going to go to and imagining what that might look like. For me, we may mention technology in this um, talk, uh, in the talk and in our conversation, but for me, that isn't about technology. It's about the future of education and the future of public education, particularly in our country. Um, there's lots of partners, um, lots of conversations that will happen over the course of the next year, lots of, people being, lots of people being a part of this conversation. So we really share that with all kinds of units across campus that will be doing thinking similar to this. Kathy Davidson writes in Now You See It, learning is the constant disruption of an old pattern, a breakthrough that substitutes something new for something old, and then the process starts again. Um, learning is the constant disruption of an old pattern. Oftentimes when we talk about teaching and learning, we, th we think about um, what students will know. And when we talk about faculty development, we think about what faculty should know when they go into a classroom for the first time. When we talk about teaching with technology, we think, what do we need to know? What tools do we need to use? I think my argument with this event is that, in fact, we should have as much of this conversation be centered on what we don't yet know. What we don't yet know about teaching and learning, what we don't yet know about even our own pedagogies. And I think so, and, and the same thing with students. So instead of valorizing the sort of putting of knowledge into students' head, valorizing sitting in that place of not knowing. So in some ways, that's what this event is about. It's not gonna answer the question that the title provokes. Instead, it's gonna be about us spending two hours together sitting in this place of not knowing what the future of teaching and learning is at UMW or beyond. I'm gonna welcome Jeffrey McClurkin, who's going to introduce our wonderful keynote speaker, Kevin Gannon. Thanks, Jesse. Um, <clears throat> it's truly a, a privilege to be able to in introduce Dr. Kevin Gannon today. Um, I, I'll start with the fairly traditional uh, part of the introduction. Uh, Dr. Gannon has local roots, right? Uh, his BA in history is from James Madison. His uh, master's is from the University of Illinois, and his PhD is from the University of South Carolina, where he worked with one of the top Southern historians uh, in the field. Uh, but since 2004, he's been at Grandview University uh, in Iowa, uh, and he now directs the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning and serves as professor of history. He has uh, coordinated programs. He's been a department chair. We had fun talking at lunch about that. Uh, he's a prolific writer in a variety of, of publications, mainstream and, and academic. He's a regular writer for the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, and he's been published in Vox and other media outlets. Uh, he's working on a textbook on the Civil War and Reconstruction and a monograph uh, for West Virginia University Press's Teaching and Learning in Higher Education series. Uh, James Lang, who was, uh, who was here a year or two ago, uh, it edits that series, so it's in that series. And if you saw the Oscar-nominated documentary 13th, directed by the amazing Ava DuVernay, you've seen Kevin before, because he's in that. All fairly traditional stuff. I could spend some time talking about his Twitter presence, um, which is hard, I think, to easily summarize, but I'll try. His 45,000 followers get teaching tips, 19th century history lessons, 
contemporary political commentary, interspersed, leavened even, by uplifting pictures of Yoshi the dog, and, and what is one of the strongest gift games of any academic I've seen. Um, but I've known Kevin for, for many years, actually, uh, both online and in person. We talked earlier about uh, meeting it in, in, in Poughkeepsie. Uh, uh, but we've uh, run into each other at a number of conferences over the years. Um, and I, uh, he is a relentless advocate, a relentless advocate for the practice and practitioners of education, uh, including and especially students. Um, and, and I think that's an important piece, that, that his understanding of the practitioners of education isn't just the faculty or the staff, but in fact the students themselves. Um, we both have core fields of experience uh, and expertise in the 19th century U.S. history, but we first met over a shared passion for the thoughtful, practical, humane integration of technology into teaching and scholarship. <coughs> and I'll just say as an aside, if you really want to get the two of us going, uh, talk to us about laptop bans. Um, but if there's a theme throughout Kevin's writing and speaking and work, it is his vigorous defense, his defense of the individual, of active student and faculty autonomy, while simultaneously embracing the value of collaborative work in and out of the classroom, between and among students and faculty. So it is appropriate and exciting that then that he is here today to talk to us about a vision for education that's grounded in access, inclusion, and equity. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Gannon. Thank you uh, very much, Jeff, for that introduction. Uh, I'm honored, and um, I'm honored to be here. Uh, it's a privilege to be here talking with you all and for those uh, looking in on the live stream as well uh, about the future of teaching and learning. Uh, as, the, as they say, I have opinions. Um, but it's, I have been a fan of what's been happening here at UMW for quite a while. Uh, and when I met Jeff for the first time in person, I was already familiar with some of the work that he was doing and got to learn some of the institutional context for that. And so this institution's support of not just technology and teaching, because that's easy, but the hard work of pedagogy and digital pedagogy and the various ways in which those overlap significantly with one another uh, is really impressive. And so to be in this space and to share some time with y'all in conversation that you've already been having in very thoughtful and very discerning ways uh, is a real treat for me. So thank you for having me here. So let's talk a little bit about the future of higher education. Um, so it's kind of a weird time uh, to be talking about this. The future of higher education in many ways is fraught. Uh, I live in Iowa, as Jeff mentioned. At a, I'm at a small liberal arts college in Iowa. You might have heard of those because we tend to close frequently, and there's another one that probably won't make it to the spring, unfortunately. Uh, so I am in a, it's a private institution, but we um, are a liberal arts institution by our ethos with students who primarily major in pre-professional programs. Stop me if this sounds familiar. Uh, and we are also essentially an open access school. And what I mean by that is we have integrated into our mission and our identity uh, the promise of access to students who have not traditionally been well served by the world of higher education in general. Uh, we were modeled on the idea of a Danish folk school. Uh, I could get all history geeky on you about that, but what I could really, basically, it's a very democratic, democratizing model of education. And, that, and, and I'm, I'm happy to be in an institution that models that, because I'm a big believer in access in public education and the power of public education, but also in any institution that's trying to advance that work. Uh, so what I'd like to offer to you in this time that we have here is a little bit of uh, table setting maybe to think about the conversations that you're going to have as you configure or reconfigure and reimagine what teaching and learning looks like in terms of its institutional presence uh, in the ways that uh, a teaching center and faculty and student development work intersects with what all of you are doing with and among your students. Uh, and hopefully we come out of this session with some conversations that are started. Uh, and that there's some traction and momentum uh, behind those conversations as well. So I'm not telling you anything you don't know um, or that you haven't observed in your own classrooms and campus when I say that it is more difficult now than probably ever before to be a college student. And I'm not talking in terms of getting into college. We have near record numbers of college admissions every year. But again, access is only part of the story. And this will be a recurring theme in my remarks here. We can talk about access all we want, uh, but is it sustainable? So for example, 
the so-called mental health crisis on campuses. Are we just better at diagnosing things than we were before? That's probably part of it. But if you look at the national landscape of what student life and student affairs professionals are dealing with, it's stuff like this. We live in a very precarious, very fraught economy. Uh, the economic and cultural landscape for many of our students is, quite frankly, unsustainable. And our students do not come to us from a vacuum. They come from things like this and with companions like this into their learning journey. Our campus has opened up a food pantry recently. We are not alone. Um, food precarity, food scarcity on college campuses, it's a thing. It may have been a thing when I was an undergraduate, but I was too oblivious to know if it was. Uh, but I will never forget the moment where I was working with one of my first year advisees and I said, what's gone well for you this semester? What's, what are the, it was the first semester he was there and he said, and I said, what's, what's really going well? What's working for you? What do you really like? He says, I can eat. So I get a full meal in the dining hall three times a day. He was, you know, the only time he got lunch in high school was at school and he was an athlete. And so he'd overcome that to get into our campus environment. So I have very little patience for the commentary that talks about entitled snowflakes. For example, our students today are graduating into an increasingly precarious and uncertain economic hellscape. Uh, they are dealing with mental health issues, food scarcity, some of them coming from economic insecurity from all the way back when. They are dealing with a political climate which denies the full humanity of some of them based solely upon issues related to their identity. And they're told by other generations that it's all their fault. Uh, so I have very little patience for that pampered student myth. It's also hard to finish being a student in the way that we would define student success. So you're all familiar with the metric of six year graduation rates. And when we look at that broken down by racial categories in the United States, we see some data that quite frankly speaks to what I might call mission failure. So our white students and our Asian students within six years tend to take a degree at fairly high rates. And these have stayed relatively consistent over the last five or six years or so. But for our Latino and Latina students, it's quite a different story. And this is one of the fastest growing student demographic groups that we have. For our black students, the statistics are even grimmer. And in fact, for our black students, statistically speaking, an African-American student who enrolls in college today, six years from today, would be more likely to not be enrolled at all in an institution of higher education than they would be to have graduated with a four-year degree. So this is mission failure. Because we say higher education is a social good. We say that colleges and universities are a social good, that they are important to society. All of the things that we do for students, we don't do them for all of our students. And we don't do them as well for all of our students. And that's a problem. It is also more difficult now than ever before to be a college faculty member. This is a visual allegory for committee work. <laughs> And of course, this is the only thing I need to show to talk about that, right? The changing nature of the academic workforce. We've gone in 40 years from almost a complete reversal in terms of tenure track uh, and tenured and contingent faculty members. About 75% of credit hours in the United States across two and four year institutions are taught by contingent faculty members. Precarious in the literal sense of the term. And it does no, it's no reflection on their performance against long odds to say that this does not provide the type of educational experience that we sell to our students. We cannot have contingent faculty members being paid less than a living wage and having to stretch across multiple institutions to cobble something together semester by semester by semester and then say this is a good way to run an academic program for our students. It quite simply doesn't happen. And for those of us who are on the tenure track or in a full-time position, you know, we can talk about reimagining our pedagogy and we can talk about the future of higher education and we can say, let's reframe our philosophy. And that's great when we're in rooms like this, talking with people and geeking out on teaching and learning. But in the real world of the 4-4 class load, the committee service, the temporary task force that we've been on for three years, and then, you know, extraneous frivolous pursuits like eating and sleeping and family, reframing our pedagogical philosophy becomes a really big ask. There's a lot of neat things that we want to try. And then we say, I can't redo this class before the spring. You know, it'll cancel Christmas, right? So it is, it's hard. 
But just because these conversations are hard does not mean that we can't have them or that we shouldn't have them. And in fact, I would argue that it's the environment that we're working in right now that makes these conversations even more urgent. We have to start answering the questions for ourselves. What does teaching and learning look like? And what's it gonna look like? What does it look like in my classroom with my students in my field? What does it look like in my type of institution? What does it look like across North America? What does it look like in a two-year setting? What does it look like in a four-year setting? We are all in this together, and we need to be having this dialogue about these questions urgently. It's really easy to critique things, though. And so a lot of times these conversations will go, you know, what does teaching and learning look like in the future? And within about five minutes, everyone will talk about their teaching load, their committee service, the crappy pay per class the increasing class size, the overwhelming bureaucracy, having to do expense reports, the loss of administrative support, and we can critique the hell out of the state of higher education. Uh, and in fact, faculty members, that's one of our superpowers, right? We are very good at critiquing. I mean, we did a PhD that developed high skills of critique, often in a solitary pursuit of knowledge. And then we learned how to defend the products of that labor against all comers and any potential argument that, we had that could possibly be mustered against it. And then we're turned loose in an institution to work together, right? What could possibly go wrong? So we're really good at critiquing things. And critical pedagogy is sort of a loosely organized body of thought, one that I think has deep relevance for us today, is very good at critiquing things as well. But where it goes that I think we need to go with it is it couples the language of critique with the language of possibility. Because pure critique is just nihilism, right? Everything sucks. All right, cool. We know that. That doesn't do anything for us. That is not new information. And it's also not worth telling our students, everything sucks, but y'all are on your own, because I have no solutions, right? So we have to talk about possibilities. So for a truly effective critical pedagogy to work, to talk about the future of teaching and learning, it is absolutely OK to criticize the present. But if we're not couching that criticism into, here's, we're criticizing this because it can be better, and here are some of the ways that it could look better. And here are some of the ways that it could function better. If we don't have that language of possibility with us, then it's really easy to sink into cynicism. But we're all here because we have at least so far resisted, maybe on the surface level we haven't, but deep down, we've resisted that trap of cynicism. Right? At its basic essence, what we're doing, teaching, teaching is what I call a radical act of hope. Radical in the literal sense of the fundamental sense of the term, the root level, right? We, what we do matters quite simply because we think it matters. The very act of continuing to do this thing with students, given all of the things that get in our way of doing it, you know, given the progressive deterioration of, say, higher education funding, given the growing public discontent with higher education, given the actively hostile climate in which much of our work now has to be conducted, the fact that we're still doing this is an assertion of hope. We're doing it because we hope, even if the evidence doesn't suggest it, that's okay. We hope that there is a better narrative out there. And we are asserting that hope every day, every choice, every class activity, every interaction with students that we have. So that's the language of possibility. Because ultimately what we can offer at our best in higher education is a place of community. So I love this uh, quote from Bell Hooks from Teaching Community. A community, she argues, is a place that is life-sustaining and mind-expanding. It's a place of liberating mutuality. And that's the phrase that I think is really important here. Liberating mutuality. It's one thing to say we're all in this together as educators, as faculty and staff. But we are in this together with our students as well. We are all allies. We are not adversaries. We are allies. We have to be. We must be. And so liberating mutuality, education at its best liberates the learner. It is an emancipatory process, but it also emancipates those who call themselves teachers. Teacher and student have to work together in partnership. And that will look different in various classes or activities or educational initiatives, but it has to be a partnership. You don't get the good stuff, the life-sustaining, uh, liberating mutuality without that. Because ultimately what we're doing, what we're doing is opposed to what we tell students that we, you know, on the admissions visit, right? You come here, you get a degree, here's our job placement rate, right? And I understand that's important. You have to do that. You have to convince parents that, you know, they're not, the graduate will go on to gainful employment. We live in a capitalist society. Them's the rules, right? But 
what we also are after, that's our hook, right? What we're really into getting students into these spaces to do is so all of us can undertake what Parker Palmer calls this profound human transaction of teaching and learning. It's not just instrumental. It's not just transactional. It can't be just transactional. You know, if all it took was, you know, here's the checklist of skills you need to do, and you'll get X job as a result, we can send students to watch four years of YouTube videos and give them a piece of paper when they're done. So what is it we bring to the table? Why do we have campuses and classrooms, whether they're virtual or face-to-face? -face? It's about what Palmer says. It's about liberation. It's about empowerment. It's about transcendent. It's about renewing the vitality of life. It's about finding and claiming ourselves. Notice he doesn't say it's uh, not, you know, it's, it's about our students finding and, and, and claiming themselves. This is all of us. This is a we. And I realize that this sort of, you know, sometimes this sort of pedagogical language from, from a Parker Palmer might sound like, you know, kind of hippy-dippy, let's all sing kumbaya and sit in a circle and anything goes, man, and, you know. No, that's, you know, we're not, we're not saying that. What we are saying is that we don't talk about this stuff enough. Internally, we know that this is what higher education at its best should be doing, right? But how often do we have this type of conversation with our students? Does anybody's syllabi have learning outcomes that talk about renewal of vitality? Or is it you will have mastered X content, right? So we ought to ask ourselves, why aren't we having these conversations with our students? The great Brazilian educator and writer Paulo Freire, um, who is author of Pedagogy of the Press, I understand you're uh, reading that in a faculty reading group here, which is awesome. Uh, one of my favorite essays by him is Education for Critical Consciousness, because I love this idea of critical consciousness. And as someone who's trained as a historian, I think it resonates very deeply with kind of the habits of mind of, this, of my particular discipline. Um, but the, the, the phrase out of this quote that I really, that if you're going to have a mantra for what we're doing in higher ed, it should be this, if anything else, to intervene actively in reality, right? We want our students, we want men and women to be able to perceive critically the themes of their time and to intervene actively in reality. If they can't do that, Freire says, they don't have the tools to keep up with the way that society is moving from epic to epic. So how do we get students to a critical consciousness, a consciousness where they can actively and critically intervene in their own reality? Now, what does that mean in practice, right? How do you intervene in your own reality? Don't we say we want our students to be active learners as opposed to passive recipients of knowledge? You know, don't we say that you know, we're not in the classroom just to open up a student's head and pour knowledge in and then shut them and go roll them through a final exam and then we're done? No, we want them to intervene in their reality. We want them to question the status quo. We want them to work carefully through text, through received wisdom. We want them to question their prior assumptions, right? All of those sorts of things that we talk about is the basis of a liberal arts education at its best is what Freire's talking about when he talks about actively intervening in your own reality. So one of the other things that I would challenge us to think about is how do we do that as an institution? How do we as members of a higher education community actively intervene in the reality of that community? What are some ways that we might do that? What we are about, what this enterprise is about is education. From, so I failed intermediate Latin my first semester of college. So before I made this slide, I actually did have to go look the word back up, and I just relived that humiliation all over again. So, but I'm okay now. Uh, so educare, or educare, uh, to draw out, to draw forth. There's an alternate definition that, that says to lead, but I think the, the root of this, to draw out, to draw forth. Education is the drawing out business. What are we drawing our students out of? For some of our students, we're drawing them out of a narrative that, has, that they have fashioned for themselves that says they're not good at X. I'm not good at math. I can't write. I don't know how to research. I'll never be able to do this. Sometimes that narrative has been crafted by themselves with the active uh, aid of educators in their academic journey before they got to us, or their parents, or their family of origin, or their immediate environment. Sometimes the students don't realize that they've crafted that narrative. They come from circumstances of resource-deprived schools, for example, that you know, deprive them of options they didn't even know that they were entitled to. And then they come to our campuses, and we have to draw them out of that. We have to draw them forth from those spaces that are anathema to teaching and learning. 
So we better make sure that the places that our students are coming into, that we're drawing them into something that matters, right? So here's this question again. Access is great, but what are we giving our students access to? And so to illustrate the point, I'd actually like to lead you through a little activity. We're going to have a graded writing assignment right here. So for the folks on the live stream, play along at home if you want. Um, it won't take that long. But what I'm going to do here in just a second, some of you are, uh, have uh, pencils and paper, or you got scraps of paper or something like that. I'm going to give you a writing prompt, and I'm going to give you very specific instructions on how you are to complete that writing prompt, right? Because in higher ed, we say we need to make sure that our students are able to listen to instructions and you know, do all those important things pedagogically, right? I'm going to give you a time limit as well. I'll be keeping time. Then we're going to grade it. So after, after you've completed the task, I'll give you the criteria, and you will grade one another's work really quickly. All right? Does that make sense? All right. Oh, the other part of this instruction, you must complete this, whether you're using a device or writing on pen and paper, with your left hand. OK? There's, there's, I always find out at this point in the presentation who the left-handers in the audience are. All right, so I'm going to give you a prompt, and you're going to have two minutes to do it, okay? Now, I understand, you know, that it's, you know it's, there's a lot that could be said about this subject, but the ability to synthesize a lot of information and to put it out in an accessible form in time limit constraints, isn't that an ability we say is really important for students to develop, right? So we're going to model that. Okay, you will have two minutes starting... Now. Copy off your neighbors, academic integrity people. <laughs> rules are rules. Forty seconds remaining. And stop. Pencils down, devices down, whatever you happen to be using. All right. So now I'm going to put up the criteria. So this is a high-stakes assignment. I don't know if I told you all that before. Um, so it's going to be worth 100 points, uh, you know, or 111 million, you know, because the numbers are arbitrary, right? But it's going to be 100 points. And I want to put up two areas that you're going to grade each other's work on, all right? Each of these areas is worth 50 points, okay? All right, so penmanship, right? We want our students to be able to communicate clearly to a variety of audiences. Well, you're not going to be able to do that if people can't understand what you're saying, right? So this is an essential aspect of writing, especially on such an important topic like your deepest held pedagogical principles. So this is 50%. Now, it's subjective, so, but you know, we're all about rigor, right? So if we have meaningful academic programs. They must be rigorous. That's what I hear a lot. That's what I read in the New York Times op-eds. So be rigorous. If it's not good penmanship, yeah, 
You've got 50 points to play with, all right? 50 points for the word count and the time limit. Again, being able to distill complicated ideas into an accessible synthesis within a, a short period of time under pressure is a really important skill that our students need to learn for you know, the jobs of the 21st century, or so I'm told. So this is the other 50%. What's the word count? And because this is a really important topic, again, this is not something you can just kind of cheese off an answer to. If the person's work does not have at least, let's say, 40 words, then there's no credit for this portion, okay? All right, so everybody clear? Yes? Doesn't that go against the distilling part? What's that? Oh, yeah, how effectively you're able to distill it? Well, you know, you want consistency, but I'm talking about rigor, so. All right, so you ready? Exchange your work, grade 50-50. I'm going to give you two minutes. Yeah, you can use a device as long as you use your left hand. That's right. I actually was watching you. It was pretty impressive. Well, we're all about digital teaching and learning, right? Remember, we must be rigorous and consistent in our assessment. I'm spitting out all the catchphrases here. Okay, so uh, did anybody pass? If we say 60 is passing, who passed? Two. Oh, no more. One, two, three, four. All right. Yeah, so how many of you who passed are left-handers? Okay. Yeah, so that's not bad. So um, did anybody get at least an 80? 90? You had an easy grader then. No one ever gets an A on this assignment. This is a weed-out class, right? This is one of those where it's you know, the famous folktale of the professor who says, look to your left, look to your right. One of you won't be with us by the end of the semester, right? That's supposed to be a sign of a rigorous quality academic program. All right, so no A's here. So, you know, with the subtlety of a brick in the forehead, I'm giving you kind of an example of perhaps poor assignment design. So what was wrong with this, besides everything? How did you feel when I put those criteria up? You kept changing the game. Okay, yeah, the goalposts moved all over the field, didn't they? By design, but yeah. And then you made it impossible for most of us. Yeah, and how did I make it impossible? Mm -hmm. Or you assumed that we would have a device that we could use mm -hmm. with our left hand. Yeah. And even though you told us we could use the device by, by us handing out paper, yeah. it implied that we probably should. Right. So I said all sorts of signals about how I really wanted you to complete the assignment. I put structures in place that privileged some of you, but really hindered most of you acting under the assumption that all my learners are the same and that they you know, all bring accurate prior knowledge with them to class. Right? So you see where this is going, right? Also, the criteria really didn't have anything to do with this. Yeah, so you wrote about pedagogy. We're here to talk about pedagogy, the future of teaching and learning, and then all of a sudden I'm having you grade each other on penmanship. Right? What the hell was that? So how many of you expected that to be the criteria? Once you said yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I gave the game away early. So. But how many of you, be honest, when I put that up and you didn't see anything about the content, were kind of pissed, or at least irked. Like, what the hell is that? I just wasted two minutes of my life that I will never get back writing left-handed about my deepest uh, pedagogical philosophies, and then here we're doing word count. Well, you also exemplified what Freire would call the appalling power structure. Yes. The traditional banking model. Absolutely, yeah, this is... Thanks. Yeah, I would textbook banking model. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Other than 
Other than that, though, I mean, really kind of a well-designed assignment, right? <laughs> so, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? So, so yeah, so this was everything that we don't want to do, right? You know, arbitrary criteria that you didn't know in advance either. I get a lot of, when I do this exercise, I get a lot of, I didn't know what I was supposed to write about, pedagogy. Well, you know, so I didn't tell you what, how you're going to be assessed. Then when you did find out how you're going to be assessed, it seemed as if I moved the goalpost to the other end of the field. You had no idea why this criteria fit, right? Because even if I had lame excuses for it, I didn't tell them to you up front, right? But the, the structural problems in particular were highly inequitable. They were dehumanizing. You were rendered left-handed or right-handed only as a result of this activity, which was a high-stakes assessment. And now only two of you are going to pass this class, or four. But I'm watching you, because I think you cheated. <laughs> right? So how many of our students experience college that way? How many students come into our classrooms or onto our campuses and find themselves you know, on an unfamiliar terrain, having to navigate spaces with terms like registrar and bursar that they've never heard before but now are expected to know, or syllabus, right? How many of them are being asked to perform certain tasks and not quite sure why they're being asked to do it, but they're being evaluated on it and aren't quite sure how that evaluation works? How many of our students put a lot of effort into an assignment, whether or not the outcome is successful, the effort was there, and receive feedback that says C plus OK? So how many of our students are navigating through those spaces? What is college doing to them? When it comes to issues of race and ethnicity, when it comes to issues of culture, when it comes to issues of ways of knowing and ways of being for our students, they are drawn from a number of places. They have come on a number of paths to come to us into our classrooms and campuses. So whether we're aware of it, whether we think we want to do it, whether we think we're responsible for it, as Amy Lee puts it, you are teaching in and experiencing intercultural classrooms. That is the future of teaching and learning. Thank you for coming to my TED talk, right? This is our landscape. It is not going to do anything but more of this. And if we're not doing well right now in that landscape, what's the future going to look like? So I would suggest that we think about inclusive pedagogy as our future. And there's a number of reasons I suggest this. One is that inclusive pedagogy is more of a philosophy or worldview than a set of tips and tricks, although there's some tips and tricks that go with it as well. But it's a set of lenses that we can look through in all of our work in this community of higher education. And it's based on two sort of fundamental questions that Frank Tewitt has articulated here. How might we rethink our pedagogy in increasingly diverse learning environments? The learning spaces that we create are now populated by a wider array of students than ever before. And that will continue to accelerate. And I would argue if we're doing our job right as institutions, it will continue to accelerate and that is a positive. That is a net gain. But how might we rethink our pedagogy in those environments? And how can we create learning environments that respect and care for the souls of our students? And again, this might not be language that you hear in you know, faculty development talks. I was here to learn how to grade more efficiently. What does the care of souls of my students mean? I am not a therapist, right? But we are full and complicated human beings, all of us. And we need to be in an environment that not only acknowledges that, but cares for that. And if we aren't doing that for our students, and I would argue that in most cases we aren't, then we're not serving them as well as we might. So the future of teaching and learning, whether it's here at UMW or in general across higher education, is inclusive. So as I thought about the title for this talk, Future is Inclusive, it also occurs to me that it doesn't have to be that way. That's one possible narrative. The future is inclusive, question mark. Because there are a lot of institutions who have structures in place and practices in place where their future will not be inclusive. There are hinge moments, as the historians in the room will tell you, where decisions are made that have ramifications across the future to shape entire environments. Is our future as a nation inclusive? I would argue we stand at one of those hinge moments at our current historical moment. But maybe we should take an emphatic stand against all that then. The future is inclusive. Uh, and it wouldn't be on brand for me to not add profanity. So, you know, but if you're going to stand for something, stand for something, right? 
our football team at my institution, the motto is go hard or go home. I think that there's a certain Zen-esque simplicity to that, right? Anything worth doing right or doing is, do, is it should be done right, as I mangle that, right? I also think that, you know, it's not worth doing if you're not having fun. So how do we make spaces that are joyous, inclusive spaces? How do we make the future inclusive? Damn it. We need to take a stand. We have an ethical obligation to take a stand. Now, I realize most of us, and certainly I was trained in a discipline where objectivity is venerated, right? That that's the goal. We must be objective. Uh, no bias, right? Just the facts, ma'am. Uh, when I talk with colleagues in other disciplines, you know, okay, this all sounds great for humanities people, but I teach math and math is not political, right? Well, you know what? Our students are coming from climates that are most definitely political, as are we. And we also work in an institution which has its own politics and its own terrain and its own cultural landscape and the own structures that it's created. So within all of those layers upon layers, we have to take a stand. We already have taken a stand, sort of by default. But if we haven't thought about what stand we've taken, maybe we want to reconsider it. So taking a stand is a political act. And I know everybody is sick of politics, or at least that's what, that's what we're told, right? The average voter is sick of politics. So politics, you know, why did you make it political? Why did you have to make this so political? You peed in the pool. No one else wants to swim in it anymore. Good job. But we have to get over that. We have to take a stand. I, it is an ethical imperative for us to assume our position, to own our stance, to make explicit what we are about here. It is unethical to not have that conversation. It is unethical to not have our students involved in that conversation either. The great philosophy trio Rush has a song called Free Will, where the line is, even if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice, right? We have chosen. So what choices have we made? And do we want to go back and maybe make those choices constantly or consciously? Our pedagogy is a practice. And like the fish who's asked to describe water, how would we describe our pedagogy? How would we describe our practice? Because our practice always derives from theory. We are informed by theory. We are oriented by theory, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we're consciously aware of it or not, and whether we choose to explicitly share it or not. All I'm arguing is that we take what we're already doing and formalize it and make it a little more explicit. Make some t-shirts or something, too, if you want. But we need to own that. And we shouldn't be ashamed to own it. So we should be about the work of equity. So if we're going to take a stand, and we're going to take a stand in favor of inclusive pedagogy, and I see banners all around your campus, by the way, that have inclusive excellence on them. So I know you all are talking about this. So what does that mean? What does it mean to take a stand for inclusion? So I'm going to suggest a couple specific points that you might consider as you articulate what that stand looks like here in your campus community. One of them is that equity should drive all of these conversations. Equity is not the same thing as equality. They're related but they're not the same thing. And so some of us might bristle at the fact that, well, I treat all of my students equally. No, you don't. So in the class discussion, the quiet kid in the back who you know knows what's happening and you want to draw them into the discussion, you're not treating that person the same way as you're treating the student who always participates. And in fact, maybe you want to participate a little less, right? That's equity because the overall good is the class climate and the class discussion. So we have to be driven by equity. We have to be driven by equity and inclusion in our campus environments. These are positive outcomes for all of our students. So again, if we know something is good, and we know something makes higher education better, and we know something improves student learning, and that there is research behind it, like this Department of Education report on advancing diversity and inclusion in higher education with key data, if we know all that and we don't take action on it, is that ethical? If our student writes a research paper where their conclusion goes against all the data that they've collected, what kind of grade are we going to give them? So how do we grade ourselves? So what does inclusion do? What does a diverse campus environment do? It plays an important role in achieving an inclusive institution. Okay, cool. But who does that? So what are we doing as faculty? Our curricular decisions and our pedagogy, our approach, our philosophy, our classroom practices, interactions with students with or within and outside of the classroom walls. We foster inclusive climates, or we can't, are we? Students themselves are reporting that they need to see themselves reflected in the faculty, 
And most of, you know, our students of color do not see themselves reflected in the faculty. And in the curriculum. Does that mean that, you know, everybody has to be personally affirmed in Little Johnny Snowflake? You know, there's caricatures of this sort of idea that I think are really pernicious. Basically, what are we telling our students? Are we telling our students that they can do this too? Or that scholarship and discourse happens around them and to them, but not from them or with them? Research suggests that greater representation of underrepresented groups among faculty may increase students' sense of academic validation. What that means in plain English and for administrators is persistence and retention. The magic words. Curriculum is key. You can have, you know, student life programs, you can have residential life programming, you can do bridge programs, you can do all, and those are good things and we should be doing them. But what are students here to do? What's the heart of this academic enterprise if not academics? So we need to be very attendant to the academic spaces, and I define that broadly, that we're creating. How are students being able to view and engage the world? So one key question for equity then, what are our students seeing in terms of who creates the knowledge in our field? So when you're teaching a class, what are you having your students read? Who's in the videos? What names are in the case studies? What's required? What ways of knowing are privileged? Can all of your students see themselves becoming a knowledge creator in your discipline? Or are some of your students thinking, I can't do that? Or no one who looks like me or no one who's from where I'm from does, I'm from does that. And so therefore, I will not be able to do that. So the famous example is do a Google image search like I did this morning for a college professor. And there you are. So you have, there's Indiana Jones. There's Mr. Keating from Dead Poets Society, right? And there's a few people of color, so it, whoops, it's gotten better. But mostly, that's what we got, right? And we know this is true nationwide. Faculty and staff have a lot of catching up to do in terms of diversity to our student body. We struggle with this mightily at my institution. And our students have called us on it. So now we struggle with it even more. So what do we do about that? We need to think about what equity means in terms of student representation and campus environment. So back to this question of if access is so good and access is important, what do our students have access to? What are we giving them access to? That? I taught at the university while I was finishing my dissertation. I won't say its name, but it rhymes with the University of Schmooston, where my average class size was 490 students. I literally could not see to the back rows of the lecture hall because of the cavernous, it was underground, which was also fun. Uh, I could not see to the back probably 10 rows. So whatever was happening there, as long as it was quiet, okay. Is that education? We know this doesn't work. We know that straight lecture to a crowd of hundreds, there are better ways to do it. It's effective for certain things, but not all the time. But do we tell ourselves that since we're a teaching institution, and that we have smaller classes that we're automatically good at this thing, right? Our student to faculty ratio is only 14 to 1. Well, what are your classes like? Because you can do lecture to 14 people just as easily as you can 490. When we talk about technology, and we have our students do all these neat things with all these neat tools, can they do those in places off of campus? So we know most Americans have access to high-speed internet greater than seven megs, although I would argue seven megs doesn't get you a whole lot, right? But does access mean the same thing as ready availability if they're using the public library? Or if they have a really crappy provider where it's in and out and in and out and in and out? So if we're asking our students to do things that involve digital technologies, are we creating affordances for them to be able to do that on campus if they don't have access to it anywhere else? Are we thinking through these issues? Are we thinking through the larger knowledge set? We, you know, we can't assume, you know, just because students are young that they're proficient on all the internet things that we old people aren't, right? Are we thinking that through? What kind of access are we giving students to if we just let them in the door, but then everything else they can't afford? So we know that college costs, compared to pretty much everything else in our economy, are going up faster. What about textbooks? Right? We know healthcare is expensive. Look at healthcare here. It's increased 575% according to, you know, adjusted inflation, but college textbooks, right? So yeah, you're using, if, if you're using a book and it's a good book, great, but how much does it cost your students? And if it costs them a lot, are they all going to have it? 
And if they aren't, are there other options? So that's where the conversation about OER comes in, for example. So just as we shouldn't skimp on the idea of equity and access, once they have access to us in our learning spaces, we need to also stand on the idea that pedagogy should not be weaponized against our students. All right. So when you say rigor, I think of corpses. Right? It's one thing to be challenging, but to set up high expectations with no way for students to get to them, that's, that's hazing. That's punitive education. That accomplishes nothing except create resentment and hostility. And if I wanted resentment and hostility, I'd just go to a faculty meeting. Right? I don't need it in my classrooms. It is dehumanizing to our students. Everybody complains about students. It's a rite of passage in higher education. But how do we do that complaining, and what does it really mean? You know, oh, my students really screwed this assignment up. Okay, cool, they screwed that assignment up. Why? Because they're dumb. Okay, that, let's talk about that, right? So how many Facebook posts, student shaming, it's its own cottage industry. You know, students don't know how to listen to lectures anymore. They're always busy on their devices doing the Google thing and not aware of my knowledge, right? Well, what's the common denominator in all that? Maybe it's us and not them, right? So how are we treating our students? What are we saying to our students? In order for learning to be truly meaningful, it must be what Freire called dialogical. Students must be involved in creating this. They must be in dialogue with us. We can't just shovel stuff out and expect them to have fully learned. Students are our allies, not our adversaries. So when you talk about the future of teaching and learning here, are you talking about it with your students? And I'm going to assume that you are, because I know a lot of the things that you're doing here. But let's keep those conversations going. So if we talk about inclusive pedagogy as well, we must acknowledge the fact that there is a hidden curriculum at work, not just in higher education in general, but probably specifically at our institutions here, right? So the idea of a hidden curriculum, we have our formal curriculum. Here is what you learn if you're a history major, the courses you take, the things that you do. But what's underneath that? What other learning is happening? We're teaching students all the time unintentionally. Who has power? Who has authority? Who says what counts? Who says what's legitimate knowledge or illegitimate knowledge? What's important and what isn't? Who gets to participate in a scholarly conversation and who doesn't? If you're teaching a 100 level survey course, are you inviting students into your field or are you telling them you can look but not touch? Are we taking our disciplinary knowledge and putting it up on the mantelpiece like some fragile fairly family heirloom that cannot be messed with or grandma will yell at you? Or are we inviting them to hold it, to look at it, to pass it around themselves, trusting that they will be careful and thoughtful about it just as we are? What does our syllabus language tell our students? What's the first encounter that's, whoops. Sorry, I got a little jumpy here, bad caffeine. So what does our syllabus tell our students? It's often the first contact that they might, if you're teaching online, for example, students will get these documents early. So here is the gateway into our course. And what does that gateway say? Maybe it's a smudged photocopy that's more institutional policy speak than it is anything about the course. Well, what does that say to your students? Do you have a two-page section on what plagiarism is, why you shouldn't do it, and how you're going to be punished if you do? And what happens if you do it a second time or a third time? Because if you do, what are you saying to your students? Yeah, this is what I expect you to do. Your default state is to do this. So what is their place? Do students know from looking at our syllabus what they're going to learn and how they're going to know they learned it, as opposed to just past assessments? Do students, are they able to trust us? Can they see us as somebody who is on their side, an advocate, in their corner? Or are we a distant, intimidating figure? Students don't come to office hours very much at all. I would argue there's a, a variety of reasons for that. But one of the biggest reasons for it is we might not be telling our students that they can trust us in a non-classroom setting. So we need to model the future we want instead of the present that we have. So if we take a stand and we say, here is our ethical obligation to stand for inclusivity, to stand for a pedagogy that cares for the souls of our students and an entire academic community, let's model that. If we stay stuck in the critique of the present, we're never going to be talking about this vision of the future. So we need to act with criticality, you know, question what we're doing, but intervene in our institutional reality. So having conversations then is not enough. Acting on conversations is. So eventually, 
you know, my, I always joke that my first rule of committees is that all of us are dumber than one of us, right? Because we get frustrated that there's sort of this inertia, we have to talk everything out, it's paralysis by analysis, and there's a space to do that. But eventually, we have to stop analyzing and start doing, because it is an urgent task that we have ahead of us. As an institution, then, let me suggest that we think about a genuine inclusive pedagogy that is the set of lenses that informs all of our practice. Not just classroom techniques, not just curriculum and course design, although those things are essential parts of it, but how we view our work with and among students in this community. In every aspect, whether it's passing one another on campus, whether it's in the library, whether it's in student life, whether it's the cashier at the bookstore, this needs to be an institutional conversation. It cannot be monopolized just by faculty or academic staff. It has to be an institutional conversation because climate matters. If we don't have these conversations, we receive the default. We get the, we get the default option, the house special. Critical theorists tell us that structures of inequality are always going to reproduce themselves until we intervene to stop that reproduction. So in history, we can talk about slave patrols going to convict labor, going to mass incarceration, you know, the steady evolution of instruments of oppression. You know, the accents may be different, but the overall thrust is the same. Well, I would argue that the same is true in any sort of institutional type of environment. And higher, higher education is no different. Structures of inequality will continue to reproduce themselves unless somebody actively intervenes in that process of reproduction. And not just to say we're student-centered. That's not enough. So here's the final question that I want to challenge you with. To what end are we doing this thing? To what end is higher education operating? So we say things like knowledge is power. Learning is good. Student-centered education, right? We tell the parents, skills for the 21st century workforce, right? So what, what end are we doing? What is the end to all of this? If we don't think about the ends, then we're going to get the same ends that we have now. So who's going to intervene in this process of reproduction, of the simple rinse, repeat, replication of structures of inequality that our society undeniably manifests and that is reflected in our environment of higher education? Who's going to intervene? Who's going to intervene? To what ends are we doing what we're doing? There are a lot of college students in this crowd. Richard Spencer and Stephen Miller have degrees from Duke. To what end is higher education working? Are we actively intervening in our larger reality as higher educators? Or are we doing so maybe piecemeal? Incompletely, unwittingly, reluctantly. To what end are we about this work? So now think about this question. Who will intervene? The default way of doing things will get you the default results. Structures of inequality will continue to reproduce themselves unless we actively intervene to stop that reproduction. Intervention is hard. Intervention is crucial. To what end are we doing what we do? To not talk about that and to not explicitly own that stance when we answer that question is an ethical failure on our part. If we mean what we say, about the importance of higher education, about the social good that it provides, about all of the things that we can do for and with our students. And there are a lot of things that are absolutely unmitigated social and public goods. A whole range of things. But if we're to follow through on that, then we need to have that conversation and we need to own our stance. Here is the social good for higher education. Here's what we do. Here's why it matters. Here's why it should be supported. Here's why it should be sustained. And here are the consequences if it isn't. We can only do that if we honestly and openly acknowledge where we're coming from. We are not objective. 
And to, to claim objectivity is to seed our, our seat at the table. To say that we're an ivory tower that practices neutrality and that, you know, this is where knowledge is made. Well, what the hell is knowledge for if it's not to change society? We already do this stuff internally. We've already internalized a lot of these conversations. We already talk about it with, with and among one another in faculty meetings or, you know, talking about good classes that we had or, you know, this went really well. This is why I do what I do. All I'm asking is to take that to a larger platform and to own it and to not be afraid of owning it. So who will intervene? I hope all of you will. Now that will look different depending on what context and intersection you have with the life of this institution. But we need institutional interventions. Uh, there is a lot at work here on your campus that could create, that has created the foundation for that. And I look forward to seeing where that goes. Thanks. So we are going to spend a little bit of time. Uh, we have two mics to do some Q&A. Um, in some ways, the second half of this event is going to be a really long Q&A where we get some faculty and staff up and um, have a conversation, partly in response to Kevin's talk, partly in response to some work that we've been doing for the last um, year or so. So um, let me go ahead and see if anyone has any comments or responses or questions for Kevin. We'll take about probably five, five, five seven minutes to chat. So when we have this awkward initial silence, let me say I will make these slides available uh, and send a link to Jesse and you can go find them and do whatever you want with them. That link up at the top here is a set of resources I curate on inclusive pedagogy. It's a Google Doc and it's crowdsourced and so it's sort of constantly in flux and being added to. So if you, find, if you want to use that link, and again, it's embedded in the slide, excuse me, in the slide, you should feel free to do so and find a, find some helpful, maybe further uh, conversation starters there. And I'll email that out as, as well as the videotape of this, uh, the video of videotape, the video of this talk, as well as the video of the panel afterwards, which will be two separate videos. Um, there's a question over here. So don't take this the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, are you ever struck by the irony that you are a white man giving a talk like this about an inclusivity and mm -hmm. diversity and um, I see you nodding so yes. how do you deal how do you deal with that irony and work through that so if I'm the only person that you listen to talking about inclusivity and diversity you're doing it wrong um, it's a conversation that involves all of us I bring to it some expertise and experience and study I'm a scholar of race and history in particular uh, but I do not bring lived experience in many cases um, you know, I'm, I'm a child of an Air Force officer. I grew up overseas. I do know what it's like to be the only person in a room who looks like me or speaks my language. I've experienced that in a basis, but that's not been my lived reality. And so I try to be very cognizant of the fact that I can speak with some authority in some places, but not in others. And I want to maintain that awareness and, and that mindfulness. Um, one thing I will say in some of these conversations that, you know, sometimes white dudes have a platform because that's the way society works and it sucks. But if that's a leverage that I've got, I will gladly use it. And so knowing that one has a platform and using it for inclusivity is a good thing, but it's also a matter of knowing when other people should be able to have that platform and ceding that space to them. So the answer to your question is hopefully skillfully, but not always. Uh, always be learning. Thank you for your talk. Um, do you have any strategies that you'd recommend for reaching faculty who are more maybe resistant to this message? My guess is that we've all bought in. Right. That's why we're here. But you know, for faculty who are a little bit more hesitant, maybe, yeah. um, what strategies would you recommend? Yeah, so y'all are the choir and I'm the preacher, right? So it's, you know, at root, these are teaching and learning conversations, right? And we all, as teachers, identify with wanting our students to succeed. Sometimes we implicitly are doing things that are not setting up circumstances for all of our students to have an equitable opportunity to be successful. And so any conversation about inclusivity touches on that core identity we have as educators. And if we can center those conversations and here is a part of a desirable pedagogical outcome of student success. And we have tons of research, uh, handily linked in that document, uh, that talks about the institutional benefits of a diverse student body and an inclusive climate. Learning outcomes are better for all of our students 
not just students of color, not just students from particular religious minorities, but our white students, our quote unquote dominant culture students. So that's the issue. You know, it's a larger teaching and learning conversation, and it's also a conversation about reclaiming the space that higher education needs to have in our society. And I think that that's something that we can all agree on as members of an academic community. This is one particularly important way to do it and to cultivate allies in particular. Well, thank you. Uh, some of us teach in fields where having a critical perspective on objectivity, mm -hmm. on the very notion of objectivity is fundamental mm -hmm. and important. And some people teach in fields yep. where they totally believe in objectivity in the old fashioned 18th century, 19th century yeah. sense. They're not in this room today. Mm -hmm. um, how, do those, how, how do we address those fields and the people who teach in those fields? Because I'll tell you, I find that my first year students who come in and are, are tell me about what they're struggling with, they're struggling with classes that are taught by, I in those sorts of fields, mm -hmm. by those sorts of teachers who don't have a critical perspective on the notion of objectivity. Right. That's a great question. Um, and one of the, we can sort of appropriate the word objectivity in conversations like that and contrast it with neutrality. You know, objectivity can mean a sort of an attempt to do a clear-headed analysis, but it's still taking a position, right? You know, the facts will lead you where the facts will. So that's an entering wedge to have that conversation. Objectivity is not the same thing as neutrality. Uh, so the other, the other thing I would say is a lot of time, and when I do sessions like this, I usually, uh, it's someone in math or science, you know, that this is not political material. Well, you know, again, our students aren't coming to us from vacuum. And we know a lot now from teaching and learning research about the way that, for example, students emotional uh, regulation or lack thereof can either promote or interfere with learning, with cognition. Uh, so what are we doing in our class? You know, that's where climate can be really leveraged in the service of teaching and learning. So in actively intervening to create that sort of climate and then saying, you know, this is a decision I'm making as a scholar of this field because I know that it will improve cognition, right? Sharing, letting our students peek under the hood. Uh, but then also our own intellectual quest, right? Like how do we handle received wisdom? You know, in our field, we do challenge received wisdom all the time, even if we don't acknowledge that we're doing it. So I think the key in those conversations with those colleagues is maybe starting in that abstract disciplinary realm and then saying, well, how do we get our students to do that thing? Right? How do we model that for our students? Because if we can model that for our students, then that's the higher order thinking that we want them to do. Uh, again, recentering it in this sort of teach larger teaching and learning paradigm. I don't know if that made sense or fully answered your question, but yeah, that's a really hard conversation. So let's take one more question, if someone has one, and then we'll continue the conversation with a different group of people sitting up front. And also, just so you know, uh, there will be a reception at 5, and Kevin will be around for that. So if anyone wants to have side conversations with, with him, he's happy to join you. Or throw something at me, either way. OK, here you go. Thank you very much for your thoughtful talk oh, and lots of, um, lots of things to, to consider here. I have a messy question, okay. and there's no end to it, perhaps. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, students will come into a classroom, and, and I, will, I will want to engage as a partner with them, at, a word you used, in learning every semester. Every semester is new. Many, some students will see a female professor and the act of partnership or engagement is they, it, they're not too sure what they're talking about mm -hmm. here. So uh, you know, that's a, it could be a response from some students. Yep. And that's problematic when, when one sincerely wants to develop that but there is resistance um, on the part of some. So any, any yeah. thought strategies? Well, and certainly, and this is where you know, we know that female faculty and faculty of color encounter student perspectives in a different way than someone who looks like me does. You know, what's the assumption of expertise? What's the assumption of authority? And that's absolutely an essential point, right? Because that will sort of set some of the boundaries, at least at first, in a course experience that we can do with our pedagogy. Um, so thinking about strategies where we move into that sort of work slowly, uh, where you do the work of sort of establishing that presence and then seeding some of that away. 
um, after it's already been established. You know, but that could be a tricky process of negotiation as well. One of the things that, you know, when we talk about things like active learning strategies and you know some of the pedagogical, you know. Uh, methods that go with it, we do encounter a lot of student resistance, right? Because how have they, you know, what have they been asked to do before they've come to us? Uh, and they're still in a stage of sort of, you know, identity development and, and cognitive development where, you know, they're moving from that sort of dualistic right, wrong to, well, everybody's got an opinion, but I'm not really sure how to sort through them yet. So, so all of these things that, you know, pro, you know the, these sorts of stages of development bring with them defensiveness, anxiety, uh, and a lack of confidence. And so I think it's important to be compassionate to students, meeting them where they are, and then sort of adjusting from there, uh, but also realizing that the work will be incomplete necessarily as the result of our course, that students are in the process of becoming, as are we, uh, and you know we're in the seed planting business. And so maybe in our semester with them, we weren't entirely successful getting them to do a genuinely collaborative partnership. You know, maybe we weren't entirely successful in moving them to a place where they were able to assess competing truth claims from an empathetic sort of perspective. But they had to start, and they had to at least try, and even if it was messy, that's still a really, and I would argue sometimes even a more powerful experience to take with them. But it's, a, it's an ongoing dialogue, and it's an ongoing uh, issue. And again, I don't have the lived experience with that, but working with colleagues who do encounter it on a daily basis, it's a really fraught process. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, let's give Kevin another round of applause. Thank you. And if the, the panelists can hop up front, um, we will just continue the conversation. Do we have to hop? No, you don't have to hop. No. I'm going to hop. Can we hop together? <laughs>